What's up YouTube, it's the one and only Legend of Winning aka Lo, and I am back again with another video. Now not too long ago I made a video discussing all the eras of basketball and where I would rank them perspective to one another. In that video I made a 12 man roster respectively to each decade and ended up ranking them. And I ended up coming with the conclusions that out of a 12 man roster somewhere between the 80s, 90s and the 2000s is relatively close. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's close when you're referring to the whole decade in its totality. Everything from the playing style, the talent, to the individual players that were playing in the 2000s era, by far the best decade the league has ever seen. And to further prove this, let's get right into the video. Here are four reasons why the 2000s is the best NBA decade in NBA history. Now when it comes to the argument of which player, decade, or generation was better than one another, it's kind of hard to make that discussion simply because there are certain rules and regulations that were set in place that dictated the style and play and the dominance of some players. You have everything dating all the way back to the early ages of basketball where they were widening the lane, making sure that players like George Mikan and Wilt Chamberlain weren't as dominant as they once were, and of course later on down the line where they introduced the three-point line. But in the early 2000s, there were a lot of rules and regulations that were set in place that completely changed the idea and the mental state of how to play basketball. Some people may differ, but honestly, I believe that the rules and regulations that were set in the early 2000s actually made the game a lot more balanced than what it once was. For example, you have the five second back to the basket violation, also known as the Charles Barkley rule. See, before this rule was introduced into the early 2000s, players were able to dominate the post simply because they were able to back down for the basket for as long as they wanted to. Back in Barkley's prime, he would literally grab the ball in the post and back down for 10, 12, or however many seconds he needed until he got into a position good enough for him to score. Fast forward to where you're in the early 2000s where you have a player like Shaquille O'Neal who's 300 plus pounds, they immediately had to put a timestamp on how long a player can actively hold his dribble while underneath the basket. So because of this there was an immediate change on how players used to dominate in the post. No longer were there players who got the ball and sat in the post for 10 seconds trying to figure out what they're going to be able to do while having the ball in their possession, you immediately had to get the ball and within a 5 second window make a decision on what you wanted to do. Because of this, all the post players that were active in the NBA before the rule change now had to add a whole bunch of more moves into their arsenal so they can become less predictable so it can be easy for them to score within the 5 second window. Not only that, the face up game became a way more valuable option. Back in the day, centers and 7 foot players really didn't face up that much in and out of the post, a lot of it was just post hooks or either post fades. Fast forward to the 2000s, you have players like Tim Duncan, Dirk Nowinski, even Jermaine O'Neal in his prime had a really, really solid face-up game. Another rule change was hand checking. For people who don't know what hand checking is, simply put, the defender was allowed to put his hand on your hip and deter you from scoring or entering the lane in which way you wanted to. Once this rule was removed out of the game, it immediately made it way more challenging for defensive players to stay in front of their man. Just for clarification, let me highlight something. It made it challenging, but not impossible. Certain players like Ron Artest, who ended up winning Defensive Player of the Year as a perimeter player, found new techniques and ways to stay in front of their man without actually hand checking. Now on the flip side of this argument, a lot of people, especially older fans, will make the claim that once hand checking was removed out of the game, it made it a lot more easier for certain offensive players to score, especially on the perimeter. Now even though this might be true, what people fail to realize is that also in the early 2000s, they introduced zone defense. Now for people who don't know from the 90s and beyond, there was a rule set in place called illegal defense, basically making it very restrictive on how teams were able to play certain other teams. A huge part of this was that you couldn't leave your man wide open to come help somebody else. If you left your assignment way too long to help somebody out, it would actually be called a technical foul and the opposing team would get a free free throw. Well, technical. In case the officials needed some help, he's pointing at the guy that's illegal is right there, John Starks. He is below the foul line, across the front of the rim, and he's not double teaming anybody. That's illegal. The flaw in illegal defense really got highlighted when players like Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal, and Allen Iverson start to enter the league. Basketball slowly but surely started to become a one-man team even though you was on the court with four other players simply because they were able to take advantage of the way the rules were set at that point in time. And as soon as zone defense and the restrictions of defensive schemes were lifted, you could immediately see the effect on perimeter players. 
If you ever go back and you see some of players' stat sheets, and especially their field goal percentage, take a note what happened roughly around the early 2000s. A certain player that comes to mind is Paul Pierce. In the 2001-2002 season, he put up 26 points, shooting 44% from the field. Immediately the next year after that, he put up 25-26 points, yet again shooting nearly 42% from the field. But then the next year after that, in the 03-04 season, there was an immediate drop off in efficiency. He put up less points and he shot almost under 40% from the field. And the same thing can be said about a lot of players. Other players like Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan also complain about zone defense. And even Tracy McGrady remembers very vividly how much he struggled while playing in the zone. I'm frustrated. Teams are playing. This is when they ingraded uh, zone. So teams are playing zone on me. I started off the season slow, averaging about 22 points. Mm, slow. I'm coming off of averaging 32. Sounds easy. Started off, they're zoning me. I'm frustrated. I, I even think I called Tyrone Lou to, to, to get MJ on the phone. Like, man, how do I beat this? Like, I, I needed some help because I was really frustrated. So even though it is kind of hard to compare one decade a generation from another, you can't come to the conclusion that in the early 2000s there were so many rule changes that made the game more balanced that to be completely honest with you, it actually made it way more easier and way more complete of a game to watch than earlier before. Next we have physicality. And I must admit people, when it comes to today's NBA players, as much as I love the NBA right now, yeah, there's a lot of things that just really get under my skin, and I cringe when I see a player like Marcus Smart flop all over the place, because once you introduce something like that into the game, then being physical is almost impossible to do, simply because you have certain players that are willing to put their own body on the line just to get a foul call. But on the flip side of that, I don't like the way the basketball was played in the 80s, 90s, 70s, and so on and so forth. Just because older fans and older players complain about today's NBA and claim it's not physical enough and that's the reason why basketball is suffering so much, I just don't buy it. The reason why I don't buy it is because just because you were more physical back in the 90s and 80s doesn't necessarily mean that made you a better player. And this problem was really introduced in the early to mid 2000s, especially after the Malice in the Palace. After that incident, David Stern really got strict on flagrant fouls and technicals and what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. And again, to be completely honest with you, I think it actually made the NBA a way better place, especially at that point of time. Now to show you the other side of this, let's look at what they were doing in the 90s and 80s and so on and so forth. A player like Bill Lambeer, who was viewed as a defensive stopper or the anchor or the defensive presence for the Detroit Pistons in the 80s, really and truly, I start to look at some of his highlights and I start to look at how he played and I start to question, was that really defense or is he just physically assaulting a man in the middle of the air? By far the greatest example to show you what Bill Lambeer used to do and get away with was in the late 80s when they used to have back and forth bouts with the Chicago Bulls and even a little bit with the Boston Celtics and of course the Magic Johnson led Lakers. If you take the time out and look at the way that Bill Lambert used to play basketball back then, again, a lot of older people would claim that that right there is great basketball, that right there is a golden age of basketball. But again, I start to look at it and I question and I don't understand how that's basketball. More or less, that's just MMA or boxing in the middle of the air while a player is trying to score their basket that they well deserve. When Michael Jordan used to beat players off the dribble and get into the lane, just because Bill Lambert used to cut him off and then push him in the middle of the air, does that take any skill? Is that technique? Or is that just, again, a man physically assaulting somebody in the middle of the air? Fast forward to the mid 2000s when, of course, pushing and shoving got escalated to the malice in a palace, and again, David Stern just had enough. And due to this, there were more rules and regulations that was implemented that made it very clear and sound on what was a flagrant foul, what was a personal foul, or what was something that was so grossly grotesque that they had to throw them out of the game. Now, due to the rules being changed, a lot of other big men, along with perimeter players, found new ways and techniques to defend players without being physical and still being effective with it as well. Again, players like Ron Artest, Ben Wallace, even though they were part of the Malice of the Palace, they still came back after that incident and were still very effective without the physicality. Also leading forward with players like Tyson Chandler and Jermaine O'Neal as well. 
So in the 2000s, we made it very clear. You can still protect the lane, protect the rim, protect the perimeter, play great defense without being overly physical like Bill Lambeer and Karl Malone and several other players in the 80s, 90s, and so on and so forth. Next, we have the evolution of basketball. Now, obviously, as time progressed, there will be more evolution in the way the game is played. And to be completely honest with you, some players in today's NBA, like Draymond Green, the fact that they are so diverse in their skill sets is pretty astonishing to say the least. But even on the flip side of that, when you look at certain players in the 60s and 70s, I'll give players like Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain their just due. Especially a player like Bill Russell. I don't think a lot of people give Bill Russell his credit where his credit is due when it comes to his mental state when it came to winning the game of basketball on a consistent basis. And I think it's fairly obvious to say that players like Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Pete Maravich were ahead of their time. But I must admit, in the 2000s, I believe that the evolution of basketball took a huge step. I mean, when you take the time on it, you look at some of the teams and players in the 2000s, they really and truly did push the boundaries on how basketball should be played. For example, you have LeBron James. LeBron entered a league where a lot of players were trying to imitate Michael Jordan. Heavy scoring point guards or shooting guards that were trying to imitate MJ's moves in and out of the post, deciding the way that they were going to dictate and dominate the game of basketball was strictly through scoring. And then in comes LeBron James, who was a 6'9", 6'8", small forward who not only was handling the ball, but also defending point guards, shooting guards, small forwards, and some power forwards, but also decided to show players not only can you dictate and dominate the game on the offensive end, but you can do it on the defensive end as well. And even on the offensive end, you can score 30 points, but also try to get 7, 8, 9 rebounds and 7, 8, 9 assists on top of that. Then you have a player like Allen Iverson, who showed us all that just because you are a point guard, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to dominate the game by passing. You can still be a dominant scorer even at the height of 6 foot 5'11". And switching gears when it comes to height, look at Dirk Nowinski. I mean, he's a 7 foot German playing power forward who's knocking down threes. And while we're talking about power forwards, let's look at Chris Webber. I mean, C. Webb used to rebound just like a power forward. He used to score in the post just like a power forward as well, but he used to facilitate, handle the ball, and run the fast break as if he was a small forward or a shooting guard. And then you have a player like Ray Allen who continued to push the idea of how dominant the three-point line could be in the NBA. And speaking of the three-point line, let's talk about spacing and how Mike D'Antoni and the Phoenix Suns in the mid-2000s continued to revolutionize the game of basketball as we know it today. I mean, you will talk about small ball, Mike D'Antoni at certain times has Sean Marion playing the five if Amari Stoudemire wasn't able to play. Now, even though there's going to be a lot of people in the comment section telling me that this is the reason why you can't compare errors from another. There's so much evolution going on in the game of basketball that it makes it virtually impossible. And even though I slightly agree with this, I just wholeheartedly believe the evolution that took place in the 2000s was a lot. And finally, people, let's talk about the individual talent, the players, the greatness that we were able to see in the 2000s because how deep it was in the 2000s that every single position is almost unheard of. Let's, let's really look at this because at every position, you can almost go three, potentially five players deep in Hall of Fame level talent. For example, point guard position. Jason Kidd, Steve Nash, Chris Paul, Allen Iverson, Tony Parker. I believe all five of them will make the Hall of Fame. Obviously, one of them already did. Looking at shooting guard position, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, T Mac, Ray Allen, Vince Carter. I believe four of them will make the Hall of Fame. If T Mac stayed healthy, he could make a huge argument that he should make the Hall of Fame. Then you have small forward LeBron James, Paul Pierce, Carmelo Anthony, Sean Marion. Richard Jefferson, I cannot lie to you, it kind of tailed off at the end with small forwards, you know, Richard Jefferson is that's a bit of a reach, but of course, three Hall of Famers in my opinion with LeBron James, Paul Pierce, and Carmelo Anthony. At the power forward position, Tim Duncan, Dirk Nowinski, Kevin Garnett, Pau Gasol, C. Webb, 
I believe four out of the five could be Hall of Famers. Then at five, we have Shaquille O'Neal, Yao Ming, Ben Wallace, Dwight Howard, Jermaine O'Neal. Two of them have already made the Hall of Fame, and you can make a huge argument that Ben Wallace and Dwight Howard have done enough in their career to make the Hall of Fame as well. So the amount of talent that was in the 2000s, just at the top five in each position, is mind blowing. To further prove to you how diverse and how much individual talent was in the 2000s, let's look at the MVP winners. Everybody from Allen Iverson, then you got Tim Duncan twice, to LeBron James. The amount of different MVP winners proves to people how many different dominant players there were in the 2000s. When you take the time out and you look at every other decade like in the 90s, Michael won it four times and then Karl Malone won it twice so that's six out of the ten years already taken up by two different players. When you look at the 80s you have Moses Malone winning it two times, Larry Bird winning it three times, Magic Johnson winning it three times. I mean at that point it's basically dominated by three or four other players. And then when you look in the 70s you have Kareem winning it five times in the 70s and in the 60s I mean it's basically Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. In every other decade it was basically only dominated by two or three other players. Of course, you had other great players in the NBA at that point in time, but I mean, just looking at the MVP race and looking at how many players won the MVP, it really does come across that only a few players were dominating the league. Where in the 2000s, it was so balanced that multiple players were able to win at that point in time. And I think that really does highlight how much talent there was in the NBA. I mean, when you look at the 2000s, it's almost unbelievable to believe that that many talented players enter the league roughly around the same time. And to be completely honest with you, I think a lot of it just simply has to do with the fact that international players start to enter the league, and not only enter the league, but of course be dominant as well. Of course, you have your players like Hakeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, and so on and so forth. But in the 2000s, I mean, there were so many great international players that came in the league, and not only came in the league, they were face of the franchise. Players like Dirk Nowinski, Tim Duncan, Yao Ming, just to name a few, Pau Gasol and Marc Gasol, both of them entered the league being the face of a franchise of an organization that just established itself in Memphis with the Grizzlies. I mean, again, when you talk about the amount of talent that entered the league in the 2000s, it's, it's just... It's just unbelievable, man. How could you not believe that the 2000s were just the best era basketball of all time? So there you have it, people. The four reasons to why I believe the 2000s was the best era slash generation slash decade in NBA history. Please let me know what you think about the video in the comment section below because to be completely honest with you all, I'm in my early to mid-20s, so, you know, that's the basketball that I grew up on. That's the basketball players I end up watching and idolizing. So, you know, I might be just a, just a little bit biased. So let me know what you think about the video in the comment section below. Also, leave a like if you enjoyed the video and always subscribe to my channel so you can be updated on the awesome content that I upload on, the, on this video on the channel this is this is the outro i'm not doing it's one take outro also um, follow me on twitter as well where i post and i always um you know i leave y'all updated on the videos that i'm going to upload and finally as always people i just i really and truly just don't know how i can express the amount of you know support i've been receiving on this channel it's unbelievable the fact that we're moving at this pace is, is crazy past 20k looking at 30k and 2k 17 is around the corner so you know I i'm going to be playing that a lot as well but i just do want to let y'all know i really do support y'all and i really and truly thank you all for whatever y'all been able to do for me and my channel it's it's crazy the amount of love and support i've received on this channel and i'll see y'all next time peace